I am Bob McNamara, Group Vice President in charge of the car and truck divisions of the company. Best wishes for success. Three ingredients which will determine financial success for you and for us. An outstanding product at a competitive price. Examination of the outlook for the automotive market for 1958. And a strong market for our products and far too little attention to the selling of product and service to the customer. Here then lies the great competitive opportunity for you and for us. So we know that the Edsel Division and its dealers will grow and prosper. One of the most rewarding ventures in automotive history. One of the most rewarding ventures in automotive history. One of the most rewarding ventures in automotive history. One of the most rewarding ventures in automotive history. 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 is a healthy economic climate in which to operate. It's the mid-1950s and the Ford Motor Company's main rival, General Motors, is eating up the sales with a wide variety of cars, each catering to a different price level. It's around this time the American car companies manage to make the automobile an extension of your lifestyle. Surely the amount of success in life is measured by the size of your automobile, right? And so how you climb the corporate ladder so you could climb the Sloan ladder over at GM. A factory worker, you start with a humble Chevrolet. A team leader, here, have an Oldsmobile. CEO of the company, treat yourself on a lifetime's work with a shiny new Cadillac. Every car for every purse. And it's Ford who envied this. See, Ford only had three brands. The low-priced Ford, middle-priced Mercury and top-of-the-line Lincoln. Ford didn't have that refined distribution like GM, and on top of that, the three divisions were getting way too close in each other's price range. The buying public was moving up market, and GM offered the right cars. But when customers wanted to trade up their Ford, they got an Olds, and not a Mercury. Something had to be done. It's the development of a strong, aggressive, and profitable retail selling organization. By the mid-50s, Ford launched a strategy to become the second General Motors with a similar brand lineup. Ford planned to launch two new brands. New was the Continental Division that would step in the ultra-luxury field and would compete against Cadillac Eldorados, Chrysler's new Imperial Division and mm, even Rolls-Royce. But it was a short-lived but beautiful run as Ford lost about $1,000 per car sold. The division was eventually scrapped. The other one was a brand that was going to be slotted between mid-level Mercury and lower price Ford. The Ford brand was going to be even more affordable, moving down market, Mercury would move a bit more up market and so would Lincoln. And the void left behind would then be filled with this new mark. This mark was going to hit the sweet spot where all the money was currently at. Middle class and up and coming young professionals that were done driving their base level Fords but didn't have the money for a luxurious Lincoln or Mercury. Yet. This would be the mark to bridge the gap and keep the buyers within the Ford family. Here then lies the great competitive opportunity for you and for us. As early as 1955, the Ford people went to work to shape and form this new brand. The project was named E-Car, short for experimental car. But what should this new car be? It's been a while a company started an entirely new brand from scratch. All the current brands are well-established names. So how was this brand going to be unique and different? Ford conducted extensive research among the demographic that they were going to try to aim for. The young urban professionals, or so Ford claimed. The extensive research was done during the mid-1950s, a time when the sun was shining bright and the grass was always green, and the cars were more shiny and futuristic than the year before. Naturally, the response of these young professionals was a car that would stand out even more. A car that had very recognizable styling. A car that was technologically advanced and had a cool name. So that you will understand what Edsel means to you. The name was a bit of a challenge, however. A well-fitted name can only come along once. 
One source mentions the name should excite the public while not alarming it unduly. It had to distance the new vehicle from existing Ford, Lincoln and Mercury labels while remaining reassuringly part of the same great family of automobiles. It had to satisfy all manner of other requirements, from starting with a letter that would look good on the front hood ornament to not rhyming with anything rude. So pretty much this belongs to Ford, but it's not a Ford. The project committee wanted one solid name, but received 6,000 of them after a contest among Ford employees run by their in-house ad agency. That wasn't gonna work out. Then one of the board members contacted a lady called Marianne Moore, a writer and poet and somewhat of a free spirit, that was tasked to come up with a name that would evoke some visceral feeling of elegance, fleetness, advanced features and design. And she sure did come up with a list of names, but one would question if these were really what Foot was hoping for. I'll let you decide. The names range from Regna Racer to Pluma Piluma to Hurricane Hurundo to Varsity Stroke and everything in between. That also wasn't gonna work out. Now it was two years before the planned release and the car had still no name. Decisions had to be made, and it was Chairman Ernest Breach that suggested why don't we name it Edsel, named after the son of Henry Ford, Edsel Ford. I mean, it was already named the E-car in the first place. The name stuck, but countered heavy resistance from Edsel Ford's children, and the name was heavily disputed even within the project committee. One could say that this new brand sure was built on trustful foundations within Ford's corporate levels. We hope you'll help us keep it a secret until after the public showing. In the meantime, the designers were hard at work to create a car that would fulfill all the other requirements as a result of the survey. And by 1957, the design process was finished and the Ford marketing machine went to work. Leading up to the final reveal, Ford set up a massive ad campaign to warm up the target demographic. Over two years, every so often, a planned leak would occur in the printed media, proclaiming that this was a revolutionary and entirely new car, like nothing else on the road. The cars would be hidden from sight in every possible way, and were under covers even on the showroom floors, like the dealers had no clue at what they were about to sell. This might be great and all, but these were the days that the buying public were getting warmed up by big motoring shows and parades and could get a glimpse of what was yet to come through concept cars. Ford, however, went a different route. The Edsel car would remain a secret all the way until its grand reveal. Why? Because Ford was convinced that the car was so good it would practically sell itself the day it would hit the showrooms. I mean, come on, Ford had done its homework and made a car that was the exact answer to what young professionals were looking for. This could not fail. And so the 4th of September 1957 was declared E-Day, Etzel Day. The day of the grand reveal of a car that would change the auto industry forever. Suddenly it is 1961, take that Chrysler. Even a TV show was set up to celebrate the big reveal, The Etzel Show. One evening, the young professionals could watch a live show on their brand new television sets with all the big names of those days performing, centered around the reveal of the illustrious E-Car. The car they had never seen before. The car that Ford was convinced of they would buy regardless. And now for the moment I'm sure you've all been looking forward to. A look at the newest member of the Ford family of fine cars. The Edsel. Edsel. The car that is already making automotive history for Ford Motor Company. A new and different car in every respect. Yet with a classical element of conservatism in its styling, which will give it maximum appeal. Okay. Is this what all the fuss is about? Is, is this it? Sure, it looks okay, I guess. But the grill, what's up with that? It looks weird. Plus, I believe I detect a slight hint of Ford in the body lines. I thought this was an entirely unique car. W where are the tail fins? This seems like a Ford after a car accident. And what's up with these buttons in the steering wheel? And is this more expensive than a Mercury? Or is this cheaper than a Ford? Huh? These were just some of the comments of confused buyers. Did this car, this 
Edsel live up to its preconceived hype that Ford created in the first place? Well, on paper it did, but in reality it did not. Far from it even. Ford had this goal of selling 200,000 Edsels per year, and that's about 600 Edsels a day. During the first week, which was supposed to be the best-selling week of all time, Edsel dealers managed to sell 350 a day. And that was a record that wasn't going to be surpassed in the future. Ever. It was all downhill from there. Because what the buying public actually saw was a car that, sure, looked contemporary with an interesting interior design and some high-tech gimmicks, but that was it. It wasn't a rocket ship. It wasn't from the future. It wasn't what was initially promised by Ford. But then, what would people expect? Expectations were all over the place, as people had no idea what to expect. You know what was also all over the place? All the reasons why Edsel failed so horribly. And no, it wasn't just the grill. Let me guide you through everything that is wrong with Edsel. We're as confident of your success as we are of our own. One of the first things that did not go as planned is that the car did not live up to its expectations, created by Ford themselves. Ford was convinced it would be a success because it checked all the right boxes as a result of the survey. But what really happened is that Ford asked the people what they wanted to buy, but never showed if they actually liked it. A product could, on paper, meet all the demands as surveyed, but the final shape and form might not meet the expectations, such as the Edsels. It had a radical and up-to-date interior, but one that had quality issues. It had a radical and instantly recognizable design, but one that was deemed ugly. Sure enough, one could or should agree that the front-end design with the bold grille made a lasting impression and statement. So it succeeded in doing just that. But the question is if this was a good thing or a bad thing. The availability of an outstanding product at a competitive price. So, the car is a bit less than expected. But what was this car anyway? If it was named the Luxury Liner 5000 or the Penny Pincher 3000, it would have been easy to understand. But the name Edsel didn't ring any bells, and so did its pricing. Was it supposed to be more luxurious than a Mercury? Or cheaper than a Ford? No, it was a mark that was trying to bridge the gap between Ford and Mercury, but even failed doing so. Edsel's pricing had a huge overlap with the already existing Ford and Mercury models. What was supposed to create and bridge the gap between the Ford and Mercury became a company that directly competed with these two brands. The cheapest Edsel had the same price as a well-optioned Ford or base-level Mercury, and the most expensive Edsel had about the same price as a well-optioned Mercury. So why would you burn your fingers on buying a car from a mark that you've never heard of when you could get something fine and trustworthy from the well-established names and far too little attention to the selling of product and service to the customer okay okay so what if we are an adventurous buyer and get ourselves an Edsel well it sure is a vehicle with an impressive list of features and gimmicks think of a rotating dome speedometer with a high-speed warning self-adjusted brakes low fuel level warning remote operated trunk and then some the flagship of it all is this, Teletouch Drive. In a day and age when the automatic transmission rapidly became the norm, companies sought ways to revolutionize the gear selection. Ford did it the best by making a push-button transmission integrated in the steering wheel. But it was a classic case of the right tech at the wrong time. The motor behind the buttons was too weak to handle it all, resulting in an unusual and unnatural shifting procedure. The wires were too close to the nice and warm exhaust manifold of the engine, resulting in melting wires with all its associated consequences. And some drivers pushed the wrong button while trying to reach for the horn in case of an emergency. You wanted to honk, but now you need to replace your entire transmission. And so there were other little gremlins popping up. Owners reported trunks leaking after heavy rains, power steering that would give up, and overall rattles and creaks. The cause of this is that Ford did not set up a separate factory for the production of Edsels. Instead, Edsels were built in the Ford and Mercury factories, but not even on a separate production line. No. For every 60 Fords built, the production line workers had to switch making an Edsel, and then switch back at making Fords or Mercury's. This was rather confusing, and many mistakes were made, resulting in poor fit and finish. 
And then there were even rumors about factory workers that were not willing to work on these Edsels, so deliberately threw a bolt or something in the door so that it would rattle as soon as the customer bought the car, just to annoy him. A detailed examination of the outlook both for the national economy and the automotive market for 1958. Ah, now here is something that influenced Edsel, but wasn't its own fault. The car was released right at the wrong time. Around 1958, America experienced a short but heavy economic downturn, and suddenly the buying public gained an interest in smaller, more fuel-efficient cars. Especially mid-priced car brands were hit severely during the recession. People resorted to lower-priced cars or European compact cars. Buick, Dodge and Mercury suffered heavily, and companies like Packard, Studebaker and DeSoto barely survived, if they survived at all. Edsel, being a middle-priced mark, was directly affected by this, as its fuel consumption was quite bad, even for 1950 standards. And that says a lot. I'm Bob McNamara, Group Vice President in charge of the car and truck divisions of the company. Robert McNamara, this man right here, played a role in the whole ordeal. McNamara made a name for himself during the late 1940s, when he managed to pull the Ford Motor Company out of the financial swamp they were stuck in. And by the late 50s, he was a respected figure with a great influence. McNamara was a true bean counter and a financial whiz kit, great for running but also ruining a company. Cars were nothing more than a number on a spreadsheet and a customer should get value for money. Cars are transportation and not some futility like dream or experience or whatever marketing term you throw at it. In his wildest dreams, we would still be driving Ford Falcons to this very day. From the beginning, McNamara was opposed to the idea of a new brand that would become Edzo, as he also wasn't a fan of the Mercury and Lincoln division either. He cancelled the ultra-luxurious Continental division, and as soon as the bad news came in, Edzo was his next target. To cut down cost, Namara ordered that the following years, Edsel should only be built around existing Ford bodies, and he also reduced the advertising budget for the brand. A year later, Robert had a bit of a chat with Henry Ford II and convinced him to drop the Edsel brand altogether, as it would otherwise be an unstoppable train plunging into a deep financial canyon. The idea was heeded. Yet with a classical element of conservatism in its styling, which will give it maximum appeal. I saved the best for last, because this wouldn't be an Ed Sonner Reviews episode if I wouldn't go deeper into the car's design. The short version of the Edsel story is that it failed because of the hideous grill. End of story. But, as I told you, there were more reasons at play. And this also counts for the car's design. Because what is it that makes this design so controversial? Where did this vertical grille come from? It all started back in the mid-50s when designers took the it-has-to-look-unique statement to heart. They looked at the cars currently on the market and concluded that many of them had a front-end design with a horizontal emphasis. So, what if this new Edsel car had an emphasis on verticality? A design piece that would stand out. This was the bottom line for the first sketches and what eventually resulted in the grille we know today. Throughout the process, designers explored the idea of singular headlights, dual headlights placed lower, dual headlights placed higher, and hidden headlights, as well as different grille patterns. They eventually settled for this, and like I said, many people say it's the grille that doesn't work, that it looks like a horse collar, a toilet seat, or even certain lady parts. All I can say is that it is not only the grille, but also in combination with the dual headlights that are placed all the way in the outer corners. What I'm trying to say is the front end effectively looks like Sid from the movie Ice Age. And why does it look so off? It's not like a vertical grille hasn't been done before. Many European brands had a vertical grille around the same time of the Edzo, and it looks perfectly fine. And it's not like the car can live without the grille. Remove it, and it looks like the most generic-looking American car for 1958. The grille really makes, or in this case breaks, the design. But it doesn't stop there. The station wagon versions had a unique rear-end treatment with boomerang-shaped taillights pointing inwards. This confused some drivers because when the car indicated to go left, the taillight would point to the right, and vice versa. 
A year later, in 1959, Edsel was given a facelift, and whereas I personally don't like the 58s, I do think the 1959s look much better. The grill is less in your face, and the headlights are moved lower. And take a look. If you once again remove the grill, the Edsel start to look very contemporary. By the early 60s, almost every car had a design where the headlights would be surrounded by the grill, and Edsel was the first in doing so in 1959. So in some regards, Edzo was actually ahead of its time. By 1960, in an attempt to further bring down development cost, it was decided to just alter the existing body meant for Ford models. In an early attempt, the car still had a prominent vertical grille piece, but the final design showed something remarkable. A split grille design theme. Where did that come from? Up until that point, there was only one other car company that played around with this idea, which is Pontiac, in 1959 one of the most rewarding ventures in automotive history. Only after a year of trying to sell Edsel's, it became pretty clear that it wasn't exactly working out the way it was expected. No, supposed to be. Ford hoped to sell at least 250,000 Edsel's to reach break-even point, but only managed to sell about half the number. Ford lost $350 million on the failure called Edsel. Oh wait, that's 1959 money. Converted to today's money, that's some $2.4 billion. Ford came to terms with this massive flop and ordered in late 1959 that Edsel ceased to exist. Production came to a stop and dealers could try to sell whatever was left. Ford even offered a $300 discount on new Ford models if you traded in your Edsel. By 1960, Edsel was gone. Good luck from all of us in the Ford Motor Company. So... Edzo was gone, but what would have happened if Ford went through with it? Were there any attempts? Yes, there were. Before suggesting the entire discontinuation of the brand, it was Robert McNamara that saw opportunity in making it a budget brand out of Edzo, or at least offer a slightly more upscale compact car model, since because of the recession of 1958, compact cars suddenly were all the rage. Over at Ford, it was pretty clear. The Ford Falcon was the answer to this problem, and was a sales success. The Falcon was McNamara's love child. But what if I told you that Edsel originally also was given a reworked version of the Falcon? The car would be sold as the Edsel Comet, and here is a first attempt at creating the Comet by mangling a Ford Falcon. This didn't stick, and so the designers came up with something else. And here is where you once again see that split grille design theme passing by. It looks bizarrely similar to that other compact car, the Pontiac Tempest, even down to the badging. But then the news came out that Edzo was getting ache, so why bother a unique Edzo family front end when the company was gone? The final result is this, the Comet for 1960, and was named as such, just Comet, until 1962, when the car was given to Mercury, and became known as the Mercury Comet. The third and probably most important factor affecting our future... I'm going to end this video with this question. What would have happened if Edsel still existed? It's an exciting design exercise to see what would have become of Edsel in later years. I tried it once by making a digital render by using a car design game. And this is what I think how it would have looked like in the 1970s. Nothing more than a reworked Ford Galaxy. And somewhere out there on this planet is someone driving a heavily customized Ford Crown Victoria with an Edsel grille. How cool is that? But these are just dreams, as that's all is never coming back. And maybe it's better this way. Money was spent and lessons were learned.